Hi everyone, uh, Patrick here. In today's video, I'll be talking about uh, the most underrated books and also the most underhyped books. And today I will mention 10, uh, 10 books. And this is again a, a different background compared to the previous video because I got some uh, uh, advice that there was, there was a bit too much white background in my previous video and until I get the new bookshelf, I cannot use the previous uh, angle. So for, for now, I think I will use uh, this one. And now you can see all the books on these two bookshelves. Let me know what you think about it. But anyway, for today's video, yeah, as I said, I will be talking about 10 most underrated books and also 10 most underhyped books. So for all of the books that I'm going to mention, all of this are rated four or below four on average on Goodreads. And all 10 books except one will have a total ratings of uh, five thousands or below. So yeah, that makes the both of them underhyped and also underrated at least in the context of Goodreads because many readers or sometimes even authors every time they see the number three at the front of their average ratings they consider their book as well uh, sometimes underrated and the number four on average rating whether you agree or not you don't have to agree obviously has become kind of like a standard for something that has been rated uh, positively super positively anyway. I personally, of course, do not agree that the number four as average rating would immediately mean that the book is good. Of course it's not. I mean, I'm talking about these 10 books today. But anyway, let's get started. I will start by talking about the book with the lower number of ratings first up to the higher number of ratings at the end of the video. And because I have made this kind of video uh, last year, I will not repeat uh, the six books that, that I have mentioned in that previous video last year. So yeah, let's get started. And the first one will be The Stone Knife by Anna Stevens. And one more thing, all the books that I'm going to be talking about today, none of them are being released this year because I want to make sure that these 10 books, well, they deserve more recognition in my opinion, even though they have been published for more than a year. And the first one, again, as I said, it is The Stone Knife with an average rating of 3.97. This was released in the year 2020, and it's been almost three years. It's been almost three years since The Stone Knife was published, and so far on Goodreads, it still only has 250 ratings. That is insane, in my opinion. So insane. This is an incredible grim dark fantasy. It is inspired by Aztec, which is well, that's different from a lot of epic fantasy these days. And Anna Stevens knows how to write great actions, great and bloody actions, and the intensity of the stories constantly ramp up. This is the first book in the Songs of the Drowned trilogy, and the second book, The Jaguar Path, is out already. I still haven't read Jaguar Path, unfortunately, because, uh, as I said, this one came out in the year 2020, and when Jaguar Path uh, I think it was released last year or even this year. I cannot remember, but when Jaguar Path uh, came out, I tried reading it, but well, I forgot too many details about the stone knife already. So in order to enjoy uh, the Jaguar Path as much as possible, I think it is necessary for me to read uh, the stone knife first. But if you love grimdark fantasy, you love great characterizations, definitely give the stone knife a read. I think it is incredible. I've read uh, the first book, by Anna Stevens, Godblind, and this one is far superior in every level. If you love Grimdark, give this one a read. I think it is super underrated and underhyped. And moving on to the next one, the second book that I want to mention today, this is uh, The Helm of Midnight by Marina Lost Tether. This is the first book in the Five Penalties uh, trilogy, and currently this book has an average rating of 3.91 on Goodreads from a total ratings of 1,600 uh, ratings. This is uh, something that I really love. It's, I think it's more precise to call this one an urban high fantasy uh, book or series. Again, I haven't read the sequel, uh, Cage of Dark Hours, but The Helm of Midnight as the first book of a series works on every level for me. It was one of the most surprising reads of the year uh, back then uh, for me. The publisher pitched this as Hannibal meets uh, Mistborn, but to me, I think it is more correct to call this one Jack the Reaper meets uh, Mistborn. The setting is definitely uh, reminiscent of London or even Lutadel from Mistborn, but the serial killer in this one, I cannot think of other serial killer other than Jack the Reaper for its inspiration. It's definitely inspired by Jack the Reaper, 
but I think it all works so well for the Helm of Midnight. Love this one, I think it is super underrated, and again, I need to read The Cage of Dark Hours as soon as I can, and probably before the release of book 3, which, is, which will be the final book of the trilogy. And moving on to the next one, the next book on the list will be my favorite debut of the year 2021. Uh, the Hand of the Sun King by J.D. Greathouse. This one currently has an average rating of 3.82 out of 1,900 uh, ratings. The third book of the series, uh, the third book of the series, The Pattern of the World, has been, I think, released recently, and I really need to get around to that one. But for The Hand of the Sun King, I absolutely love this one. It flows so well. The narrative and the writing flow so well uh, for me. Great House has such a beautiful and accessible prose, and the magical school trope being implemented into this book, I, it was just so good. I think I have mentioned it many times now that the magical school or the magical academy trope is one of my favorite tropes in epic fantasy, and this one has it. When Alder is a great character, I love reading the relationship that he built here with his mentors and his friends, and although Garden of the Empire did not work as well as the Hand of the Sun King uh, for me, but I still look forward to reading the pattern of the world as soon as I can. I think this one uh, to this day is still very much underrated. And if you love an epic fantasy with a coming of age theme and also magical school troupe with a beautiful writing style that is also accessible, I think you should try reading The Hand of the Sun King. It is also one of the few books I think it is the only book in epic fantasy that features calligraphy as such an integral part of the story. Moving on to the next one, it's of course, when it comes to underrated books, this is one of the most underrated epic fantasy books, The Forgetting Moon by Brian Lee Durfee. Look at this cover art. This cover art is done by Richard Anderson and it has remained stunning to this day. But The Forgetting Moon currently has an average rating of 4 out of 2,100 ratings, even though this book has been released for 7 years now. I think it is unacceptable because this book, it is, well, let's just say that if you're someone who think that prophecies and also uh, farm boys and other classic fantasy troops makes the story predictable, I think you will be mistaken when you read The Forgetting Moon. Many moments in The Forgetting Moon was unpredictable to me, and I remember that Malice by John Gwynn is one of my favorite fantasy debuts, right? And when I read that one, I absolutely fell head over heel. And then I read The Forgetting Moon, I was reminded of Malice, but this is completely different in a way compared to Malice, even though it features a lot of uh, similar elements to Malice by John Gwynn. So yeah, if you love Malice by John Gwynn, but you want something even more darker and morally gray, you should try reading The Forgetting Moon. Plus the entire trilogy, uh, The Five Warrior Angels, is completed now. And let me tell you that Brian Lederfee has ended this trilogy with a bang. Both The Blackest Heart and also The Lonesome Crown, both of them are absolutely incredible and epic. So yeah, read this one. It is severely underrated epic fantasy book. And then the next book on the list will be another book that's being published in the year 2016. It is A Paternus Rise of Gods by Derek Ashton. Paternus Rise of Gods currently has an average rating of 3.97 on Goodreads out of a total uh, ratings of 2,400. This too was released in the year 2016 just like uh, The Forgetting Moon by Brian Lee Durfee. But yeah, uh, this one is underrated. I don't consider myself as a fan of urban fantasy, usually. There are plenty of urban fantasy that I tried reading, and it just did not click with me. Of course, I love the Dresden Files, but that also doesn't happen instantly. Now, Patternous Rise of Gods, or the entire Patternous trilogy, is a trilogy that I love from the first book. Now, I do understand why this one is a bit underrated, because the first half of Patternous Rise of Gods is completely different from the rest of the trilogy. The first half of this one was a bit of a struggle for me. Dirk Ashton know about this. Uh, I consider the first half to be a bit more YA. <laughs> yeah, you will see the main character falling in love instantly with the guy. And the writing itself at first really felt like it is a YA urban fantasy. But then suddenly things started to change in the second half of the book. And you know, the pattern of trilogy is one of the most clever and inventive way of using mythologies in urban fantasy. It is, at the end of the series, it has become an urban epic fantasy with wars, massive war, involving hundreds of thousands of individuals and gods. Incredible. And if you love mythologies, you love urban epic fantasy, try reading a Patternous Trilogy. Love this one very much. And I think even though I understand, as I said, that the first half of this one is a bit disappointing to some readers, myself included, but I think it is worth persevering. So worth it. We're halfway through the list now, and the next book I want to mention is Scourge of the Betrayer by Jeff Salyards. This is the first book 
in the Blood Sounders Arc trilogy. And Scourge of the Betrayer was released for the first time in the year 2012. It has been 11 years. And at the moment, I do not think a lot of people are still talking about this series, unfortunately, which is a shame because I think this trilogy, as of course, as the topic of this video, is one of the most criminally underrated grimdark fantasy trilogy that I have ever read. And it is such a shame that I do not think a lot of people have read it. But the first book, currently, it has an average rating of 3.5 out of a total of 2,800 ratings. Again, a shame. If Salyards writes some of the greatest action scenes, this is a military grimdark fantasy. Now, the first book has pushed off a lot of people because the first book, well, it is, to put it simply, a long prologue before Jeff Salyard started pushing forward the story in the second and the third books. So it is quite understandable why a lot of people bounced off the first book. There were a lot of mysteries unexplained and the characters did not feel too interesting yet. But for me, there was something about the narration that felt so compelling. But I think that's also because I like reading a point of view from a character that is a scribe. This is the story that is told through the perspective of a scribe named Alki, and he's following the tale and, well, actions of a legendary a killer. A killer and mercenary, Brylar Kill Coin. And because of this, well, let's just say because of how iconic this guy is, well, Alki definitely underwent through a lot of changes throughout the trilogy. And the actions and battle scenes throughout the trilogy, as I said, it was just incredible and vivid. I think if you love Joe Abercrombie's style of battle scenes, I think not completely similar, but I think you will like reading a Jeff Salyard's battle scenes. But right now, uh, although this trilogy is complete, the entire trilogy is really underrated in my opinion. The sequel, Veil of the Deserters, and the third book in the series, Chains of the Heretic, which is the best of the trilogy, all of them are underrated and super underhyped. And I do not know whether the author is still writing right now or not, but well, that would be sad if the author has stopped writing because I think he has so much potential to write an even more accessible and well-written uh, grimdark fantasy or even epic fantasy. But anyway, seriously, if you love grimdark and also military fantasy, try reading a Blood Saunders Arc trilogy. Start from Scourge of the Betrayer. And now let's talk about the book that made me fall in love with reading Rob J. Hayes' book. So it is Never Die by Rob J. Hayes, the first book in the Mortal Techniques series, a series of connecting standalone novels. This is a wuxia and anime-inspired uh, novel. This is a short book. It's less than 300 pages long. It has the shortest a prologue that I have ever read, but the main character, Itami Cho, is still one of the most memorable main character uh, that, uh, that I've read in epic fantasy because I love that character. But to be fair, this character always reminded me of uh, the anime Sword of the Stranger. If you have watched that anime, I think you will know what I'm talking about, so I'm a bit biased because of that. And I know that Sword of the Stranger is indeed one of the main inspirations behind Never Die. The story is about a boy named Ain who is on a mission from the God of Death and he is tasked with the mission to find four legendary heroes, kill them, and then bring them back to life to serve him in order to fight for the Reaper's War. If that premise sounds interesting to you and you love wuxia, you love anime, you love a story about unlikely heroes trying their best, well, to win, try reading Never Die. I think it is incredible. And this is not even the best book by Rob J. Hayes. I've read uh, plenty of books by Rob J. Hayes, I think six books now, but my favorite of him, uh, by him so far, it is Spirits of Vengeance, which is the third book in the Mortal Technique series. But uh, Never Die currently has an average rating of 3.9 out of 3,400 ratings. And I personally think it deserves more positive uh, ratings and of course, readership. I still have three more books on my list today, and the next one is, of course, Priest of Boons by Peter McLean. This is the first book in the War for the Rose Throne series, and the series has been completed. I have made a video on why you should read War for the Rose Throne series. The video is completely spoiler-free, so if you want to check out that video to find more details about my thoughts regarding the whole series, feel free to check it out. But this one currently has an average ratings of 3.96 out of 4,800 ratings. That is still underrated. I think it deserves to be above 4 at least. But for those of you who love Peaky Blinders and you love Grimdark Fantasy, well, try reading Priest of Bones, especially if you love a main character's narration that's so distinct. A distinct narration from Thomas Piety is definitely one of the biggest strengths of the War for the Rose Throne series. I have read quite a lot of books ever since I finished reading War for the Rose Throne. 
and it is still super hard to actually find a narration as distinct as the main character here. I think Peter McLean has outdone himself by crafting such an, well, such a distinct narration. And the ending for War for the Rose Throne was satisfying and so fitting, uh, in my opinion. Once again, because I'm talking about this series, I have to mention that I actually appear as a cameo in the third book, Priest of Gallows. And also, just one more thing, Priest of Bones, from my reading experience anyway, is the weakest of the entire series. So if you like Priest of Bones already, I think the rest of the series will convince you to love it. And book number 9 on today's video will be for Age of Assassins by uh, R.J. Barker. This is R.J. Barker's debut novel and I know uh, right now R.J. Barker is often praised for his work on the Tide Child trilogy which started with The Bone Ship. But I think for me anyway, uh, the Wounded Kingdom trilogy is still a superior trilogy overall. I love this trilogy very much. I think Girton, uh, Girton Clubfoot is... We don't frequently see an assassin that behave like him. He kind of reminded me of Fitz and the first book Actually, I think it would be suitable to those who like Assassin's Apprentice by Robin Hobb. It features a lot of themes, beats, and also premise that can be found in Assassin's Apprentice by Robin Hobb, which is the first book in the realm of the Elder Ling series, the 16 books uh, series. And also in comparison, thinking about it, I think Girton, uh, the main character, Girton Clawfoot, can be, I think he can be compared to Fitz uh, as kind of like a poor assassin. <laughs> Except that Girton is more capable compared to Fitz, especially when it comes to battle. I love Fitz, okay, but you know what? He made a lot of bad decisions throughout the entire series. And speaking of bad decisions, in the second book of the Wounded Kingdom trilogy, you will want to slap Girton Clawfoot as well, but this is intentional. The character need to go through that character development, but Anyway, <laughs> I'm not here to talk about the second book and the third book of the trilogy. I think the entire trilogy is great, but as far as the entire trilogy goes, uh, it has a, such a super satisfying ending, but this one is the most underrated one of the entire trilogy. And finally, the last book on today's video, this is the only book on this uh, list that has more than 60,000 ratings. But this is for a good reason, because I do believe that this book is still underrated considering its status and its importance in the fantasy genre. Currently, this book has an average rating of 3.96 out of 69,000 ratings on Goodreads, and I'm talking about The Dragonbone Chair by Tad Williams. This is the first book in a memory, sorrow, and thorn trilogy, and right now I'm making my way through to Green Angel Tower, the third book in a memory, sorrow, and thorn trilogy. I'm really close to being finished with this uh, trilogy. And once I'm done with reading to Green Angel Tower, I will make sure to post a review on my YouTube channel, but I have posted a full review on the Dragonbone Chair. But again, as I said in my review of the Dragonbone Chair, it is a classic, and this is one of the few books that can actually remind me of reading Tolkien's writing in a way that it felt melancholic and the world building felt so incredibly intricate and so vivid. It felt so immersive reading a Dragonbone Chair. Many people complain about the first 200 pages of the Dragonbone Chair, the slice of life portion, and I have to disagree. I love that slice of life portion in the Dragonbone Chair. It is true that I came into this book, I read this book with the right expectation, with the right reading mood. I knew what to expect. I knew that I was ready for this kind of slow pacing. But personally speaking, I never mind slow pacing as long as the writing still felt compelling and that is what has been achieved by Tad Williams. The writing is reminiscent of Robin Hobb. If you love Robin Hobb's style of writing, I think there's a really good chance you will love uh, Tad Williams' uh, writing as well. But Simon and Binabek, there have become one of my favorite bromance in epic fantasy, and also the tale of Ineluki, the Storm King, and everything regarding memory, sorrow, and thorn, the three great swords of the series in the Austin Art Saga. They are some of the best reading experience that I have ever read. I'm still not sure whether Two Green Angel Tower will actually top the Dragon Bone Chair or not. I guess we will find out soon. But right now, I will say that they are about, they're about equal in quality. Dragonborn Chair is really fantastic, in my opinion. Love this one, and considering its status, then it has inspired several popular and highly acclaimed epic fantasy these days. I think this one is still quite under hype and 
definitely underrated. More people need to be talking about the Dragon Bone Chair and the entire Austin Art Saga. At the very least, Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn Trilogy. Now, I need to remind you that this is not a complete list, but again, these are some of the most underrated and also under high fantasy books that I have ever read. But I love all of them very much. I think they deserve more recognition, they deserve more praises. And I hope if any of these books are books that you haven't read, I hope that you will give them a try and fingers crossed that you will end up enjoying them as much as I did or maybe even more. But yeah, I think that's pretty much it for me today. Do let me know what you think about the books that I listed today. And of course, let me know what are some of the most underrated and at the same time under hype books that you have ever read in fantasy or sci-fi. As always, thank you so much for watching and thank you for your support. Bye-bye. Lastly, I want to say thank you so much once again to all my patrons who keep on supporting me.